There is an extraordinary group of players who in the history of rugby union worldwide have amassed an incredible 100 test caps or more during their career. On that elite list is World Cup winning Springbok captain, Hall of Fame inductee and one of the top rugby legends of all time, John Smith. John, it's an absolute honour to have you join us here at the Rugby Business Network. Thank you for taking the time. Anytime, it's good to be here. So John, with 111 caps for South Africa, over an 11-year international career, it might be safe to say that lifting the Webb Ellis Cup in 2007 was the greatest moment for you in the Springbok jersey. Although, is there another moment for you that comes close to matching that one? And on the other end of the scale, what would you say was the lowest point of your career? Yeah, I think with the, you have a career that long, there's pretty much a lot of, of both. Well, you hope there's a lot of highs and, and there certainly are a lot of lows. Yeah, World Cup 20th of October 2007, that was a pretty special moment. You know, it's, it's a difficult one to explain it's not like an excitement of being able to win it it's more relief than anything else it's a four year journey that took so much time and so much um, work and to actually win it was more, more of a relief than anything else I think that kind of occasion sort of makes an, makes a group, makes an era, you know, mm. of, of that of those guys that I played with for a long time. So, you know, very special. I think if I think of really amazing moments, uh, what comes close to that, I think, is certainly the British Irish Lions in 2009. Mm. That year, I think, really was a sort of a vintage year for that group. Other great memory was beating uh, the All Blacks for the third time in a row in Hamilton um, you know, after that British and Irish Lions series and to take uh, another Tri Nation. So, yeah, we've had some amazing highs, yeah, I must mm. say. Uh, Lowe's, oh, jeez, what do we lose? Five or six in a row a year before the World Cup. <laughs> Our uh, inglorious exit uh, slash performance at the World Cup in 2003. You know, so, mm. yeah, there's, there's, actually, there's actually quite, quite a long list. So I'll keep <laughs> it down to two. <laughs> well, your club career at the Sharks in KwaZulu-Natal was also spectacular, having spent an incredible 13 years there. However, you ended your career at Saracens after playing in England for two seasons. How did the two clubs compare and how how did you find adjusting to life in the UK, considering that you had also had a one-year stint at a French club, Clermont? Yeah, I was fortunate. I, I'd never left South Africa. I'd never played anywhere else other than in Durban uh, up until 2007. And um, having a, a year um, at Clermont was, was amazing. I mean, it's one of the top clubs in the world. And uh, the setup is just incredible. So it's a completely different culture, language, way of playing, everything about it, you know. Um, the one thing that sticks out was, you know, you sort of, you home a lot more playing in the Northern Hemisphere. Mm-hmm. Uh, then coming back to the Sharks and then spending my last two years. Uh, I think all three scenarios were completely different. Each had uh, their different advantages and disadvantages, but yeah, I don't think any of them could really compare to the kind of environment mm-hmm. that, that I found in Saracens. You know, mm-hmm. It was a pretty special place with some pretty uh, incredible people having contributed to an environment that was pretty unique in terms of what I'd ever, ever experienced from uh, what it could be like to be a rugby player. Um, I've, I've come out of cultures where a lot of coaches and administrators sort of felt they sort of had to treat the players mean to keep them keen and it was the complete opposite of Saracens and the better that the, the players got treated there, the, the harder they worked. So, mm. I was fortunate to have those three very different experiences and uh, all three of them added a huge amount to my career. Mm. It was at Saracens, though, in 2013 where you played your final professional game of rugby before hanging up your boots. When the decision came to retire, John, was it difficult for you in any way to deal with that? And what was the most challenging part of moving into another career? I was fortunate in terms of I was actually meant to carry on playing. I'd signed another two-year deal to play in Toulon uh, after Mm -hmm. my two years at Saracens. And uh, obviously with the opportunity that came about being offered the CEO role at the Sharks, that's what really cut my career short by two years. But I say cut short. Um, it was as long as it should have been. I played, I think, 15 years um, professionally and mm. it had an incredible journey. Uh, my body was starting to sort of break down and I was getting, uh, finding it harder and harder to get up on the Sundays. Mm. So it was the right time to call it. Um, people always ask whenever you at a game, whatever, if you miss it, it looks so tough right now. It looks like the hits look bigger. Mm-hmm. Everything just looks faster. I have that feeling of contentment. I just, I, I was very fortunate to play for a long time. I had, mm my fair amount of injuries but they all sort of came in between seasons and you know I managed to play quite a lot in 15 years so I had no regrets in terms of finishing mm-hmm. I think if I think of the, of the one thing that I miss I guess it's that continuous banter you know, in a, in a, in, on a tour in a bus at a restaurant with, with the boys all the time and then that buzz of standing and singing a national anthem in front of 80,000 people you know mm-hmm. with your 
with your family and going into battle. So those things are hard to replicate, but the actual playing part, you wake up on a Sunday and actually being able to go for a cycle and close your kids, it is pretty cool. Most definitely. Well, to follow up on that, John, how would you describe your transition going from the rugby field and then into the boardroom for the Sharks back in South Africa as chief executive where you held the position for three years? Yeah, so I, I don't think I could have asked for a better next chapter. Um, it was incredible. I, I had very little experience in business other than my own small little businesses. And obviously I was chosen for a specific reason from a rugby point of view and mm-hmm. I, with the backup of what was a very powerful board and still is. So it was an unbelievable three-year journey. And I think what the one thing it did was it's such a such a great job with so many challenges that it did distract me from the thing that I guess gave me a buzz by playing rugby. You know? So the, the sort of challenges of the boardroom I guess replace the challenges of what you 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 felt in a test match, etc. And I think mm-hmm. the one thing that I did probably get wrong was, you know, the one thing you forget about when you transition, and I think a lot of us forget about it when we transition out of being professional sportsmen into the real world, because mm-hmm. I mean, what we do for a living as sportsmen is really a fairy tale, you know, with everything just given to you on a, a sort of silver spoon. You're told what t-shirt, what time, where to go. Mm-hmm. You are almost bred into being a sort of <laughs> a useless individual in the real world. Mm. The one thing that I did realize quite soon, probably two months after I finished, was there's a little monster inside of us that's been feeding on dopamine since we were, what, 12, 13 years Mm. old, competing for our first teams or our eight teams or playing sport and trying to win every weekend. And every weekend, that little monster gets fed a little bit more dopamine every single time. And then I came back home, got stuck into this big job and got into the real world with all these other uh, uh, pressures Mm. and didn't, go for a run, didn't go to the gym, didn't cycle, didn't anything. And uh, I promise you, after two months, I felt like there was something missing from me. And <laughs> my wife eventually said, look, you're, you're the grumpiest you've ever been. Just go, go for a run, get out of the house, do something. Mm. And I, I mean, I definitely wasn't going to run. It took me, I barely ran when I was spring back. So <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I got into a bike and chased skinny guys in Lycra for, for about an hour and a half, nearly popped a lung and came home and I felt like a million bucks. I, mm. like I felt like alive again. So I think that's the one thing that they forget to tell you. you know, well, there's a lot of things that they don't tell you about transitioning out of this fairy tale of being a sportsman where sort of life is unbelievably easy into sort of the real world. You know? But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they are going to, be programs in the future that give these guys the, the sort of necessary mechanisms, coping mechanisms, mm. in terms of facing the reality of what life is about. Absolutely. Well, it's been a year now, John, since your resignation as CEO of the Sharks. In hindsight, what was that experience like and what was the greatest lesson you took away from working behind the scenes at a rugby club? Wow, well, that's probably one of the most incredible three years chapters of that I've ever had. I mean, uh, uh, obviously coming in unbelievably green. So I dived in and jumped into every single different department. That's the beauty mm-hmm. of a rugby franchise, that it's a business, but it's you know, linked quite heavily to a game that you're very passionate about. Mm-hmm. So retail, sponsorship, entertainment, there's just so many uh, areas that I had to dive into. And I think uh, there, were, there was a lot more than one lesson that I learned. I learned a million lessons, to be fair. You know, I just got to understand the mechanisms of a boardroom. I got to understand, sadly, the the inner depth of politics around you know people's egos and who wants what at the expense of the game's progression. You know that I guess is one of the sort of more disappointing things. Where in a team you've always got guys in good teams, you've got guys that are all there for the good of the of the team. Where I found that wasn't quite so in the real world. Certainly not in rugby administration. So mm-hmm. you know, for me, I think the lesson was you know it was a it was an understanding, a very quick lesson in understanding the reality. But uh, I love the fact that you know I was you know for three years challenged in every single way. You know we had a lot of work to do. I think when I took the job, you know I, I possibly didn't quite understand how uh, I guess vulnerable South African rugby was from an administrative point of view and certainly from a financial point of view. And those were not the challenges that I expected to face. I really thought that my challenges would be purely from a rugby point of view. So mm-hmm. I jumped in with everything we had, and you know the decision to leave that job was quite a difficult one because mm-hmm. I quite enjoyed the challenge, and I honestly thought that I could possibly enforce some kind of change, maybe not on a national scale, but certainly mm-hmm. hopefully on, on, a, on a provincial scale here mm-hmm. in Natal. So the lessons were, were vast, purely around the boardroom, understanding you know the real world and how it works, and that. Not everyone in the real world is wanting the same thing, which is you know, what makes the team better. Being able to 
quickly figure out who those people are that do actually uh, want to contribute to the greater good rather than just to self-enrichment. Mm. Many lessons learned indeed. Well, John, these days you are actively involved with Rugby Centurions as managing custodian of the foundation. On the website, it states that it is the toughest membership in the world, and it certainly is, as only three in every 1,000 players uh, ever reach the prestigious 100 test milestone who came up with the concept of rugby centurions and what is the objective of the foundation yeah it's uh, an interesting story i mean i wish i could tell you it was my idea but certainly not <laughs> you know when i when i finished the sharks um a businessman uh, slash philanthropist gavin Regis in johannesburg mm-hmm. called me and said would i come helping with an idea he's got and uh, he and another guy andy drysdale had come up with this idea about well now it's probably five years ago Mm. And um, they have toyed this idea. I mean, the crazy thing is that it's never been done in any code. There's never been something like it to celebrate sort of, I guess, the icons of any particular sport. And again, I guess rugby union is so unique with its mm. values and, and what it stands for. That's, I guess, fitting that rugby is the first to do so. So, you know, putting it together really required a major ingredient. Gavin and his crew had done most of the groundwork in terms of setting it up as a business and a charity and putting everything in place and registering it. And my job was really to get the centurions behind this project and see if it was something that they wanted to um, to be a, a part of because mm-hmm. it's not designed to in, uh, enrich the centurions. It's really designed to try and grow the game of rugby and help where we can. So almost be another arm and alumni, I guess, to World Rugby where we can be another organization that. Uh, hopefully can raise some money that has an effect on the game and breaches that gap between, I say, rugby and football and uh, helps the game grow in, in, in many ways as, uh, and while all along keeping its, its values and, and what it stands for, which I think is very important because it's a, a very young professional sport at the moment. So, mm. yeah, three in 1,000, I think that's not just guys. I think there's, uh, I think we're on eight ladies who mm. managed to achieve the, the same the same milestone. It's an incredible concept which has now become reality because the inaugural launch of this unique uh, World First initiative will be held at the Hilton Metropole Hotel in London on November 23rd, uh, 2017. What are you looking forward to the most uh, from the launch? Obviously, my, my nerves are shot. I, I just want to make sure that all the centurions who have is basically a kickoff of what will hopefully be uh, an organization that has the ability to, to change the game and help people within the game for, for the better. So mm. we've got about 800 guests coming to this dinner um, with rugby's royalty there. And uh, I'd like I'd like that first dinner to really be a display of what's possible when we put all these powerful people who have either played the game or are still in the game together to try and give back on a platform that is designed to, to make them able to show their gratitude for what the ga- game gave them. Mm. Well, as much as rugby centurions will be celebrating the contribution the handful of rugby greats with 100 or more test caps have made to the sport, it is also an opportunity to attract financial investment and to grow rugby around the world, as you touched on briefly just now. How can companies get involved with the foundation and is it only financial support which is required? Well, look, I think financial support obviously is is, is, is a big thing. It helps mm. us to start projects and we've got three basic concepts that we want to start with. So one of them obviously, as mentioned before, is is actually mental health. It's creating mm. a, a leadership course or a, or a mentorship course for athletes or, or sportsmen or rugby players that are in the game mm-hmm. um, to be able to come and see and speak and hear and listen about h- how to cope with the world, real world with transitioning out of the game. I think we're seeing more and more cases of depression and rugby players, I guess sportsmen around the world that are mm-hmm. finding it very difficult to transition from the sort of fairy tale of sport into the, the harsh realities of surviving in the real world. Mm-hmm. That's one of the initiatives. Obviously, grassroots rugby will always be important because the more people attracted to the game, the better. That's really what will make a, a big, big difference. And then to try and spread the game and find out how we can increase its popularity in territories that perhaps aren't as strong as those like South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, mm-hmm. and I guess Europe. So th- those will be the three things. And obviously finance helps to get those kinds of things going, but anyone who, ha- who finds a synergy or an alignment with what we stand for, mm-hmm. which means building a game, and has the ability to assist in some way, whether it's supporting or joining or or calling uh, out to us to see if we can align ourselves in their territory in, in, in how to grow the game. Mm-hmm. I think there's many ways, other than just financial support, that, that people can help. So 
it really is getting in touch with, with us on, on social media mm. and actually get a feel for what we're about. Brilliant. Well, John, aside from your involvement with Rugby Centurions, what else are you up to uh, these days? As following your resignation uh, as Chief Executive at the Sharks in 2016, you said that you wanted to spend more time with your family and you were also committed to staying unemployed for some time. I must be honest, the Centurions has kept me pretty busy. Mm. Uh, I've had for the last nine months felt like a glorified team manager hurting cats, trying to get them onto the bus on time. Uh, so uh, we'll see how successful I was. But mm. uh, yeah, unfortunately, I mean, my, my wife and I have got a few businesses in Durban that sort of keep us busy enough to be here at home and mm. keeps the lights on as well. So all sorts going on here from, a, I guess, a small entrepreneurship mm. point of view. So it's been a fantastic year. I'll tell you what, as difficult as it was to leave the, the Sharks and, and, and leave that, that job, mm. um, it has been an incredible year. And I'm, I guess what made it even more special is the culmination of having this dinner become a reality and mm. Centurions actually getting off the ground. Mm, that's wonderful to hear. Well, most elite athletes, uh, such as yourself, John, end up writing a book as you did with uh, your autobiography titled Captain in the Cauldron, published in 2009. What was your motivation behind writing the book and uh, do you think there could ever be a follow-up book? To decide to write a book was a pretty difficult one. I think uh, I ended up having my kids pretty early and I didn't really get to experience that sort of, that era of my life. You know? So mm. I thought, you know, one way is to sort of leave a book behind. <laughs> they get to hold on to this as a memory, I guess, a reference mm-hmm. for what happened in that time. You know, mm-hmm. and then, and I was pretty aware when I was playing that it was purely be a chapter in my life and not my entire life. You know, rugby was always unbelievably important to me, but it wasn't it wasn't my entire existence. You know, so mm-hmm. I think it was a, a difficult thing because when you write a book, you've also got to decide what you put in, and what you put out, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, invariably you've got to leave more out than what you put in because stuff there that can obviously damage other people and make life difficult for others as well. Mm. So I had to be quite diplomatic in terms of how I wrote it. One thing's for sure, I could certainly write another one, uh, a far more interesting one, but uh, it would get me into a heap of trouble <laughs> and put a lot of other people in trouble as well. So <laughs> I'm not sure there'll be a follow-on. Oh, <laughs> pity about that. Well, John, being a leader is ingrained within you as before you even captain the Springboks and in your corporate role at the Sharks, you were a head prefect at Pretoria Boys High School. How would you describe your style of leadership and does it still serve you in any capacity today? Um, I think leadership is within all of us. We've got some kind of leadership within us, and I think everyone has their own version of responsibility and how they approach that. Leadership, I guess, yeah, it has been sort of thrust upon me from an early age. So I was six and eight years behind my brothers, so I sort of grew up alone. Sort of, it's hard to say how it started, but I guess it's just, I guess, from really being, being brought up in, in, a, in, a, in an unbelievable way. My mom and dad mm-hmm. instilled some amazing values in me and, and put some pretty stringent boundaries in terms of right and wrong. And if you've got those steadfast the versions of what your values are and what you're standing for and what's right and what's wrong. Mm-hmm. I think leadership is more about those that are willing to follow you mm-hmm. than what what you can tell other people to do. So I guess I'd be a guy that I'd like to, to attract people to the way I behave and, and, and my consistency both in the limelight and out the limelight. And truly really are the same people all over the place, mm-hmm. even when people aren't watching. I guess that's really the key. That's so true. Well, finally, John, what's lined up for Rugby Centurions in 2018? And for you personally, what are your goals and hopes that you want to achieve in business or elsewhere in the future? Rugby Centurions has got a huge amount of potential. And um, it'll be a very interesting three to six months post this first dinner to see what kind of traction it gets. Mm. I believe it has a huge amount of potential. I can see the enthusiasm that World Rugby has for it and, and, and it's and, and what it possibly can do to help the game grow. But we, we really won't know until we see how this thing gets off and what kind of interest it, it gathers amongst both the public and the corporates. You know, So mm-hmm. we have this group of amazing people who've done this, these amazing things and they are willing to give up their time to grow the game. Uh, and so if there's some support for that commercially and and certainly from a, from a fan base, you know, then I'm sure we'll have a long uh, history or journey of, of being able to give back. For me personally, obviously business is something that does interest me and uh, I always find it interesting because people always seem to determine business success by the amount of money a business makes, which of course is very important. But having spent the last year uh, being able to do a lot more things on my own, I guess, have weekends for the first time and you know see my kids and drop off and pick up and do these kinds of things. Mm. I guess if you ask me what I want about a business, I'd say I'd, I'd want to do things that interest me. Mm. I'd like to make enough money to keep my kids educated and healthy, and I'd like to be able to grow not only my business, but the 
the people around it that contribute to it. Great way to end it off right there. Well, John, it's been such a pleasure to have you join us here at the Rugby Business Network, and we wish you all the best for your career ahead as well as uh, for the growth of Rugby Centurions. Thanks very much.